All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? I got it out. If if people want to retake their seats. All right, the, the Japan in me feels the need to get started very promptly. You're, you have one foot in each world, yeah. All right, uh, why, don't, why don't we go ahead and start again? I know some people are still trickling, trickling in, um, but we want to keep on schedule if we can. Uh, so once again, my name is Ryan Schaefer. I'm the president of the Japan America Society of Washington, DC. Uh, I am uh, pleased to be able to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Hiroyuki Akita, uh, who was former uh, bureau chief of the Nikkei office in Washington, D.C., which is how a lot of us know him, uh, but is now a, a prominent uh, commentator and, and journalist in, in Tokyo, um, and a reliable commentator on our, our subject for today. So it's really a privilege to have him here with us. Um, he is a, uh, his formal title is Foreign Affairs and International Security Commentator for, for Nikkei, uh, and he, uh, Previously served as editorial writer, um, senior writer, and a Beijing correspondent. Uh, and perhaps more importantly, he's a, a uh, hobbyist chef uh, who prides himself in his butaniku, uh, or sorry, in his buta kimchi. Uh, he likes to cook Korean cuisine, which I think is important and and maybe relevant in some way. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, will, um, I will cede the stage to him, and then after he's given uh, his, his remarks, uh, we'll do a, a Q&A session uh, until about 2 o'clock. So uh, please join me in welcoming Akita-san. So, so thank, you for, thank you very much for inviting me to this conference. It's very honor to be here. Actually, uh, I visited uh, Washington, D.C. last week, too. And my editor told me that uh, you are working very hard to m interview many people and try to understand what is going on in Washington and get the fresh perspective. So he said, good job. But this time, he didn't smile. And because I know the reason, because I will travel to Paris next week from here for another conference. So my editor told me that he didn't, without smile, he, my editor told me, just have fun. <laughs> my wife asked me, if, are, you, are you really working or traveling to Paris? <laughs> so it is always challenging to travel to Paris, uh, not as much like to travel to Washington, D.C. But to be serious, uh, today I'd like to uh, talk about uh, long-term trend of Japanese strategy where Japan is heading to. And again, uh, it is also challenging to talk about Japan as much as I travel to Paris uh, because uh, it's boring. It is Japanese politics is not as exciting as that of uh, American politics. <laughs> Japan could once entertain or amuse the world by changing the face of prime minister every year and the name of uh, every year, and also I wonder people who's going to be the next prime minister. But now we have the uh, same face as the prime minister for eight years. 
And everybody, and not everybody, but some people started to get bored at looking at him, but the opposition leader's face is also as boring as, as well. So <clears throat> it is very challenging. But to be honest, I think it is a very important moment to observe and also to carefully watch Japanese strategic direction. Because I think that Japan is standing at very crucial crossroad in terms of its, its direction of its foreign policy and security policy, or maybe strategy. Um, oh, today, I know that it is a very outdated style to use PowerPoint in this town. But uh, please allow me to use just uh, six slides and to show, show them up. So before I came here, since I'm a journalist, I asked uh, several senior officials in Abe administration a very simple question. That is, what is the biggest concern in terms of foreign policy and security policy? Then they say, number one, Iran and Middle East. And second, China. And third, uh, North Korea. So I thought it, is, it was a very, very boring answer. Nothing interesting. But as I talked in depth with them, I found it is very interesting because they do not necessarily worry about, they are not necessarily worried about the behavior of Iran or Middle Eastern situation or behavior of China and North Korea alone, but their concern deeply related to a U.S.-Japan alliance, a future or sustainability of strong U.S.-Japan alliance. So, Iran, let's look at the interactive map of the SIP. We can see, you know, dot, red dot and green dot shows the um, SIP and tankers. We can see many SIPs is coming, uh, coming from Middle East and go, coming from Middle East and go to Japan, and many SIPs are coming from to Japan to Middle East. Uh, Japan relies on, as you know, uh, Japan relies on about 90% oil import from Middle East. So as long as U.S. will be able to maintain very, very strong military presence in the Pacific, as it, it does now, Japan doesn't have to worry about uh, the security and safety of long sea sea lane that connects Japan and Middle East. But now, in the midst of uh, Iranian crisis or Middle East crisis, Mr. Trump said that, why does Uf US have to defend tankers of Japan or Korea or China? They are the ones who are relying on Middle East. And the US is reducing its reliance on Middle East as a, so as a source of energy. That is very true. So. The Japanese government official worries more in this context about the situation in the Middle East and the Xi Lane situation. China. Maybe this picture, is, this map is as familiar with some of you. It is a, this map is upside down, and it shows the maneuver of Chinese military, uh, Chinese Navy, and uh, Air Force. You don't have to. Uh, you look in, you know, understand the detail of this, but you please just feel how Chinese military is, military is active and uh, doing exercises and surveillance and monitoring operation. And this itself is a source of concern, but Japan, I think Japanese government worries more in the context of the prospect, uncertainty prospect, prospect of US-Japan security treaty. In other words, changing balance of power in this region. This is a picture from uh, think tank CSBA, which illustrate the maybe few, near future of the Pacific maritime domain. Due to the, this shows, due to the rapid expansion of military capability by China, maybe Pacific will be div divided to uh, three domain. Red domain, hostile zone, 
where US will not be able to operate as freely as it does now because of China's you know, access denial capability such as submarine and missiles. And blue, blue area where US can operate freely. And then green is the middle. If this will be the reality in the future, even if US and Japan are determined to maintain strong US-Japan alliance, Japan cannot count on US security umbrella anymore because US cannot operate in the time of contingency. And if China continues to expand its military budget, maybe this could be the reality. So in this context, Japan worries about China. What about North Korea? As we can see here, Japan is within the range of uh, several hundred mid-range ballistic missile of North Korea. But as long as it's conventional missile, maybe we don't have to worry so much. But uh, there, is, there was very, I think there was very important turning point last year, around summer. Uh, that is Japanese defense white paper for the first time acknowledged that North Korea, well, which issued the assessment that North Korea may have miniaturized existing nuclear warhead, small enough, light enough to deliver them by existing ballistic missile. So when I interviewed several defense officials, they say, we have to assume now that Japan is within the range of not only conventional, but nuclear ballistic missile of North Korea for the first time in history. And so this itself is uh, you know, very scary, but as long as US deterrence capability to deter North Korea or prevent North Korea from uh, launching some military provo provocation, Japan worry, doesn't have to worry so seriously. But again, uh, Mr. Trump, says last year, short range and mid range missile test are not a problem. North Korea is keeping a promise not to launch ICBM, which can hit the US, or nuclear test. Um, in a private meeting, Japanese government or Prime Minister Abe quietly tell his counterpart, or Mr. Trump, that it is a problem because Japan is already, Japan might be already within the range of nuclear ballistic missile. And if they, you know, uh, improve their accuracy of missile, this means that North Korea can more easily use that missile because they can hit Japanese target more precisely without, uh, you know, unnecessary casualty. So after all, uh, what is, oh yeah. So this is the uh, uh, only slide I need to you know, show uh, at the first part, half, half of my presentation. So Middle East, Iran, Middle East, and China, North Korea. Biggest concern Japan have now is deeply related to the sustainability question of strong US-Japan security alliance. And this morning, of course, assistance. I hope I'm very glad that Mr. Stilwell, Stilwell is not here. I'm not challenging him. He said that the you know, US Japan Security Treaty is strong as ever. And Japan, it is true that US Japan government jointly um, issued a joint statement to state uh, alliance is strong as ever. I do not challenge and I do not counter argue that it is, not, it is wrong. Maybe it is not incorrect. But I'm not so sure that it is true, you know. So uh, when we look at uh, operational level, uh, self-defense forces and US military's interoperability is very, very deep and deepening. And also uh, US-Japan security cooperation has been making a lot of progress. And moreover, when we look at the highest level, Mr. Trump and Mr. Abe's relation is, as uh, Mr. Stewart said, 
very, very good based on a genuine friendship. <laughs> Mr. Abe is the only leader who can play, who could play golf, golf and enjoy four times and keep the score of the game as a state secret. I think that the Abe, I suspect it is classified, so I don't know, but the, I suspect that Mr. Abe lost game by slim margin in order not to offend Mr. Trump. So it's very good relation. And Mr. Abe and Mr. Trump met uh, bilaterally more than uh, about 14 times and talked on the phone more than three, or talked more than 30 times, maybe about 33 times. So this, is, this frequency of the con highest contact is maybe, you know, highest, most close communication between two leaders. But if we stick back and look at the, I'm not talking only about, I'm not talking about only about Trump, Mr. Trump individual, but I'll go to the more you know, broader observation. But if we step back, uh, President Trump's view about the alliance is scaring, if not frightening or horrifying. He said, he openly criticized U.S.-Japan security treaty as unfair, and he thinks that it will have to change. He once implied that he wants to withdraw from South Korea, uh, if possible, and he, want, he doesn't like a joint exercise between, uh, you know, uh, ROK and U.S. because it is expensive. So obviously for him, uh, alliance is not an important asset, rather it is a burden or cost. I'm not criticizing, you know, uh, from American point of view, maybe it contains the element of truth. But uh, Japan believes that alliance is kind of mutual beneficial. So Prime Minister Abe again, at a private meeting, tried to persuade Mr. Trump several times. For example, Mr. Abe explained Mr. Trump that Japan bears the, maybe about how, it, how we count is different, but maybe about 80% of a cost for U.S. military, military to stay in Japan. And Mr. Trump said, as I heard, I've heard, Mr. Trump responded, I don't know, I've never heard that number. Is it true? He asked to the advisor who were at the meeting, and the advisor responded, yes, sir. And Mr. Trump said, maybe. And then uh, he raised the same question again and again. So it is very difficult to persuade. And he often uh, mentioned, reportedly he often mentioned samurai spirit of Japan. He says, uh, Japan once had a samurai spirit. Why is it? What's this? What he meant is, why doesn't Japan uh, maybe it spend more money for defense or maybe, maybe, I don't know, but maybe he, he doesn't like Japanese constitution, which prohibits Japan to engage maybe offensive operation unless Japan is under attack. So I talked about Mr. Trump's view, but let's step back further and see if his concept or approach is his individual one or his approach to allies, not only to Japan, but ROK and Europe, is a long-term reflection of changing long-term U.S. security approach or commitment to Europe or Asia, or Middle East, where, where else? I think there is a growing of recognition among, in Tokyo that it could be latter rather than his individual approach, but it could be a long-term reflection of long-term trend. Maybe uh, two simple evidence, evidences. For example, it was not uh, Mr. Trump, but it was Mr. President Obama who declared that U.S. will not play the role of world policeman anymore. He made that remarks. And it was not... Mr. Trump, but, was, but it was Mr. President Obama 
who started to demanding NATO countries to spend 2% of, uh, increase the defense budget to the 2% of GDP. It was 2014. So there is a trend uh, to ask allies more burden sharing in order to sustain alliances, which is understandable. And Mr. Trump, it is fair to say that Mr. Trump is accelerator, but he is not causing this trend. And what if Democrats win the presidential election? Maybe this trend will get reversed? I don't think so, because uh, many, there are many Democrat supporters who support uh, people, candidates like uh, Mr. Sanders or Mr. Elizabeth Warren. And I don't think that any, I don't think that any Democratic pre, Democrats president can say that, okay, we will play the role of policeman again. Or we will spend more money to you know, deepen the military commitment in Middle East or abroad, maybe even in Asia. So uh, tentative conclusion is that US allies, including Japan, have to, is better, had better to assume that uh, this trend maybe get accelerated or not, slow down, but this is a long-term trend. And again, I'm not criticizing, I'm not blaming US. You know, the uh, US uh, has been fighting the war in Middle East and also in Afghanistan for 20 years, about 20 years. As I understand, uh, 20 years war is one of the longest war U.S. engaged in modern history. Maybe intervention to Haiti in the 19th century could be, uh, you know, longest, but the, you know, interven intervening to Haiti, intervention to Haiti and, you know, fighting the war in Middle East and Afghanistan are totally different dimension. So then uh, last point is if it, it premise is that uh, U.S. needs time, will need time to rehabilitate from this series of war and rehabilitate to regain the energy, if it will, energy to deepen its military commitment, sustain strong leadership in the world. If U.S. needs, it, if, it, if it requires several years or decades, what is the option for Japan? Or maybe allies in general? Here is my uh, conclusion. Plan A and A dash is a status quo. Plan A is sustaining strong you know, alliance with the U.S., which is a very least risky and status quo. But as I said, it is, may, may not be a possible. So plan A dash is for Japan, again, Mr. as Mr. Stilwell said, we Japan will enhance security cooperation with Australia, India, and some other countries to supplement or complement or support uh, hub and spokes uh, system of U.S. Japan or U.S. Australia, U.S. ROK alliances. This is the Indo-Pacific strategy, actually. This is the Indo-Pacific initiative that Japan maybe invented, and now U.S., Japan, Australia, probably India, to uh, try to pursue together. But Plan A dash is based on the premise that U.S. will maintain strong commitment to the region. So logically, if uh, we, this premise is not given in the future, we have to move to plan B, three plan Bs. And again, I don't want you to misunderstand. I'm a strong supporter of plan A. I don't believe that uh, no other option, no other better option than plan A. U.S. German Security Alliance, indeed. But I just want to intellectually, I want to provoke myself and everybody uh, by saying that we maybe, what could be a plan B? I think three plan Bs. 
Every plan B is a very, very painful. <laughs> Plus plan B, regional security framework without US. So in this context, uh, Japan may, will be forced to, to change Constitution Article 9 and then sign a defense, mutual defense treaty with India or Australia, some other country, and try to defend, try to help each other. Maybe this uh, may work in a peacetime competition, but does it work in the wartime? If Japan was attacked, would be attacked, can we count on Australian and Indian troops to come to Japan to help? May, even if they were to be willing to do that, distance means a lot. So plan A, plan B1 is maybe uh, is not so you know, feasible. Then plan B2, independent homeland security approach. Japan do not spend, Japan spend only on homeland security. Anti-ship anti ballistic missile, missile defense, maybe submarine, or cyber in, uh, in budget investment to re improve the resiliency against cyber attack. And forget about the you know, uh, budget to complement U.S. military operation because Plan B doesn't have, a, you know, based on the premise that the U.S. Jap US will not, uh, U.S.-Japan alliance will disappear. Maybe Japan can achieve that. But uh, now, uh, China's military budget is four times bigger already than that of Japan. So I don't think it is uh, better than nothing, but not sustainable. And Japan uh, is increasing defense budget incrementally, but continuously for past eight years. And next, next fiscal year's budget will be about 5. 3 trillion, trillion Japanese yen. It is about 48 billion US dollars. It is the biggest. But still, plan B2. I, I cannot count on that. So in that case, plan B3. That is unequal partnership with China to secure Japan. Uh, China is bigger. Uh, in terms of the GDP, they are bigger than in, uh, bigger about three times more. So I hope equal partnership, but uh, when we look at the balance of power, maybe uh, Japan have to make a concession on Senkaku Island and so on. And sign kind of like, uh, you know, partnership or security arrangement to secure Japan. That is very, very painful. And uh, maybe I'm not so sure about the pub Japanese public will be happy to accommodate that. So. I wrote this kind of piece, actually. My work is to write op-ed, and I wrote a piece that uh, it is time to rethink, which means start intellectual kind of thinking uh, about how to reduce the reliance, deep reliance on US military. I'm not saying that we should abandon alliance, of course not, but reduce the alliance reliance so that it's going to be more sustainable. Then, so basically I criticize Japanese government. Being, Japanese government is, get, is being paralyzed, just saying that the US-Japan security treaty and so on is not good enough. But unfortunately, it was, I think it was last uh, March, March last year, I needed to have uh, lunch with a senior official of Adam, Abe, 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 Abe government on the day when I published that piece. So I printed it, and I gave it to him, and he said, I read it, and I scared a little bit. But he said, thank you for writing it. Thank you. And I get puzzled. Why? And he said, uh, some people, some individual in Tokyo, in the government, have kind of the same kind of instinct that maybe it is important to think about broader spectrum including maybe possible plan B or A dash, in order to seriously come up with a prescri prescription to sustain plan A. Plan A is possible, plan A is sustainable, only when we seriously think about how it is painful when we lose it. Plan B is, how it, plan B is difficult. But it is so 
delicate and sensitive, it is taboo to trigger that discussion inside government. If somebody say, let's discuss about it, maybe he'll be in the risk, he'll be at the risk, or she. So uh, that is, I thought that that is a uh, you know, mindset uh, in Tokyo. And uh, I think that uh, my, as a journalist, I'm better, I'm not good at the moderator, but maybe I'm at the provocator <laughs> in a good way. So uh, that's all, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, well, th thank you very much. Uh, that was just what we um, what we were hoping for, and, and why we uh, were so enthusiastic to invite you uh, back, even just a week a week later. And and I know that you were just in in uh, the U.S. last fall as well. Um, and and surprising uh, capability to to put together a very coherent and persuasive argument, despite uh, being thoroughly jet lagged. I'm sure. <laughs> um, but uh, if I could start, actually, uh, let me pause before I get into question and answer and, and just reiterate um, our thanks to uh, Jim and the Carnegie Endowment for, for uh, hosting this event and really putting so much of the uh, uh, intellectual heft and, and uh, institutional competence behind it. Um, so we really, really appreciate you hosting us once again. Um, so let, let me fire off a few questions while uh, audience members are formulating th their own, and then we'll, we'll turn to the audience. Uh, but since plan B1 and B3 are still up there, I, I was hoping I could dig a little bit more uh, into those two. Um, and maybe start uh, with probably the more provocative one. I, I note that in, in sort of gaming out uh, a plan B1 and describing the uh, the relationships that, that Japan might have to strengthen with, with regional allies to right. secure its own right. uh, defense. You, you, uh, you mentioned uh, India and Australia, which are, which are quite far away, but there is one neighbor that's much closer that you didn't mention, and that's the Republic of Korea. Um, so I'd be interested to know a, a little bit more about your thoughts there, and, and, and perhaps uh, a related Korea question is... Um, Korea, I think from the Korean perspective, uh, took a, a, a painful, uh, politically painful step in walking back from their threat, uh, presu presumed threat to withdraw from the Jisomia agreement. Um, but in the recent uh, trilateral summit or bilateral summit in, in China, uh, I, I think that there was some expectation that the, the, the prime minister might have taken a step towards reciprocating. Right. And he really didn't. He, he took a very firm stand um, and, and restated the Japanese position that, that, no, 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 you cannot celebrate giving back what you shouldn't have taken in the first place. Um, so I just wonder about you know, domestic politics in Japan, I'm sure, are playing, playing a role. Uh, is there more than meets the eye? Is there public or private uh, action uh, to, uh, to re respond to the, uh, the Korean step? And then what about Korea in a, in a plan B1? I knew that you would ask about South Korea and Japan relations. <laughs> I know. And uh, first of all, I think it is very important to reconcile with South Korea by overcoming history issue. That is basic. And having said that, I wonder if a country, any country, can they cooperate closely because they are friendly? Or even though they are not friendly, they cooperate because when they share the common strategic interest. During World War II, Roosevelt cooperated with Stalin. Totally unfriendly, totally unshared value, but share the common strategy, goal, to fight against Germany and Japan. So you know, I'm not so sure that this analogy can be applied to you know, current situation. But I, when we look at the strategic calculation of Japan and ROK, 
I should say that uh, there is a challenge to di diverge, or th there is a risk of a di diversion of its strategic goal, strategic priority, because of the two L factors. One is rise of China, and also nuclearization of North Korea. Uh, Japan is separated by sea from China, but uh, South Korea is connected by land. And also South Korea's reliance on Chinese market is I think uh, how much uh, about China export, uh, maybe more than, I cannot uh, remember exact figure, but the reliance on, on South Korea on the Chinese market is bigger than that of on US, Japan together. More reliance on China. And North Korea now have nuclear <coughs> missiles, we should assume. At least they have nuclear bombs. So for South Korea to avoid the war, whatever it takes, is important, higher, highest priority. Because war means, not a conventional, but a nuclear war. But for Japan, highest priority is get rid of, eliminate those nuclear missiles to secure Japan. So, uh, of course, Japan preferred to tougher approach to North Korea, while South Korea wants to ease tension and, if possible, maintain dialogue and then try to you know, stabilize the situation. And in this context, try to do a kind of like a effort to deal with nuclear. So, um, I think that the diversion of a strategic interest, strategic kind of priority between Japan and South Korea is a challenge for both countries to improve relation or maintain good relation. Of course, uh, history, history issue is one of other big element. Well, that, that's interesting, especially from the, I mean, this, this event is all about the DP, DC perspective on, oh, yeah. on the, the look forward. And I think the DC perspective tends to be that the rationale uh, for a stronger relationship there is, is the shared values. Right. Um, so that's a great, great uh, alternative perspective. But it also brings us to plan, plan three, which I think presumes past a little bit of, of that rationale. Um, and I wanted to bring up the subject of, of another important regional country that, that you did, didn't mention, um, but I'd love to hear your thoughts, and that is Taiwan. Uh, I mean, presumably, um, Plan B3 presumes uh, some unfavorable uh, circumstances for, for Taiwan. Uh, but of course, uh, Japan has, has a tight relationship with Taiwan, and, and certainly uh, a, a, the implications of the US-Japan alliance uh, really bring Japan squarely into the, that strategic calculation as well. Um, so if you, if you could address Taiwan a little bit and, and your perception of Japanese interests in, in, in Taiwan. You are very good at dropping bomb on yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I think that the, for plan A, to balance against, balance against China and maintain a favorable balance of power. For in this context, Japan, Taiwan is very important for Japan to how can I say, maintain the balance of power. Because Japan is willing to also maintain the balance of power in a plan, plan A option together with the US. But the plan B3 means, virtually means accommodation of China's influence, so we have influence in some degree. In this context, the mean Taiwan, existence of Taiwan means totally different. In plan A, Japan may, may want to support Taiwan quietly, in order, in, quietly enough not to provoke China, but quietly for them to be able to balance against China. But in plan B3, it's based on premise that Japan will be forced to, in some degrees, forced to accommodate China's influence. So in this context, supporting Taiwan, does it, is it helpful? It will definitely provoke China and make Plan B3 very difficult. Because you know, China will get very angry, resented, and Plan B3 will be impossible. So my point is that the meaning of Taiwan, uh, significance of Taiwan, Taiwan, implication to Japan 
is totally opposite depending on which strategy Japan will pursue, plan A, plan B, A dash, or plan B3, a combination of China. Yeah. All right, well, th this is perfect. Let me, let me drop one more bomb in that <laughs> case, uh, because it brings us back to China, and uh, Japan uh, is preparing for a state visit uh, for President Xi in March or, or April, April soon. Yeah. Um, uh, so how, how does that, um, not necessarily how does that fit into your plans A, B, and, and the dashes and, and versions, um, but reflecting a little bit more on, on, on you know, look, looking more immediately where this uh, conversation is about Japan in the year, not Japan in the decade or century, um, but Japan presumably has, has been uh, concerned about events in Hong Kong, concerned about Chinese meddling in the Taiwanese election. Uh, and yet, we have a state visit coming up. So how do, how do we understand the upcoming yeah. state visit? Okay. Uh, I personally uh, do not necessarily support the idea to invite him as a state guest. It is good to invite him. But uh, it, uh, in, you know, in the midst of Hong Kong, situa you know, Hong Kong instable situation, also Xinjiang problem, uh, I do not think that the Japan should necessarily uh, invite him as a state guest. But also, I think that it is good to invite him to Japan because it is the first visit to Japan by Chinese president in 12 years. 12 years. Yeah. US president, Chinese president have a mutual visit more frequently, but the 12 years. And that is the first point. And second point, how does it fit to this you know, Japanese uh, strategic options? You know, uh, Japan now try to pursue plan A dash. Very strong multilateral security framework based on US military press, based on strong US military commitment to the, to the region. But Japan also want to hedge so that Japan hedge to other options, of course, as well as every nation want to do. So want to hedge some energy on plan B. And because we don't know, uh, in maybe this year, five years, okay, but in 20 years or 30 years, maybe we need to you know, seriously think about plan B, plan B. And in that context, uh, Japanese effort to invite, invite Xi, President Xi this year, is to diffuse tension, unnecessary tension between China and Japan. Uh, in other words, uh, Japan-China relation, maybe say, let's say it is minus temperature, and then I don't think Japan, China, neither expect that it would go up to like a you know big plus, but try to bring it to the zero level so that we can avoid unintended conflict. Uh, so Japan hoped for Japan hoped to sign, I think, sign some agreement to set up defense hotline. We have a contingent in Japan and China have now contingency contingency emergency contingency meca uh, you know, contact mechanism at the lower level, but maybe hotline between defense minister and Japanese defense minister, and also wants to discuss to make uh, uh, progress on the 2008 agreement on the East China Sea energy exploration. That is also another potential source of conflict, but China doesn't want to, SOHA has been you know, kind of cautious to make this agreement to be to upgrade via treaty or agreement, official agreement. So Japan want to do it. So all effort is to achieve not partnership, but it's detente. It's a detente, diffusing tension. So that is, that, that, that is not necessarily contradictory to a plan A dash, I think. All right, well, I, I will have one final question that I'll oh, queue up for you now before I turn it over. And, and, and that is, uh, again, we're about making predictions for the year ahead. So by the end, I'm going to ask you to predict three sports in which Japan will take the gold medal in the Olympics. Uh, so you can think about that for a, a moment. But then why, why don't we turn to the audience? Uh, and the uh, gentleman in the brown sweater, I think. Hand went up first, and, and as a reminder, uh, please uh, state names and affiliations uh, at the beginning of the question. 
Uh, hi, my name is Jim Patrick. Uh, I'm a freelance interpreter and a Japan American Society member. I'm, I work for myself, so no affiliation. Uh, I wanted to ask about the dispatch of Japanese mar maritime self-defense forces uh, to uh, the Persian Gulf, to the Middle East. Uh, that's not part of the U.S. coalition of the willing officially. I think Korea, South Korea, has done something similar. I was wondering if you could talk about that dispatch overseas of Japanese troops in this context of hedging against the U.S. alliance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you show the slide again? Oh, it's, it's okay. Oh, it's okay. Uh, as we uh, saw, there are many, many tankers and ships and, uh, in this. This is the situation. And then Japan wants to, and Mr. Trump says, why does the U.S. have to defend you know, Japan, Japanese or Chinese or Korean tankers? They are relying on. So Japan took that statement very seriously, then decided to send dispatch uh, self-defense uh, warships. But at the same time, Japan don't want to provoke Iran because it is counterproductive. So Japan needed to walk very slim and fine line, show that resolve that Japan will make utmost effort to defend Japan's ships by itself. But I, in case maybe Japan will need help, but not listen. But also, uh, Japan explained to Iranian side, not only to Washington, that it is Japanese intention. So Iran openly said that Iran doesn't oppose. So this dispatch is a very delicate uh, decision so far. I think it is, you know, it works well. Yeah, so that is my understanding. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ardavan Mobisheri from uh, University of Richmond. Uh, going back to the security scenarios that you mentioned and, and, and you talked about a little bit about the, um, <clears throat> uh, the uh, trade figures uh, between Korea and, and uh, Japan, but if you actually look at, um, so China is the biggest export market for Japan. Uh, Japan is the third biggest export market for China. Uh, Korea, uh, China is the biggest export market for Korea. Korea is, uh, Japan is the fifth biggest export market for Korea. And Korea is the third biggest export market for Japan. Uh, if you go out 10 years from today, the three countries combined GDP will be bigger than the European Union and bigger than NAFTA. And so if, you, if economics, and I hate to look at it purely as an economist, uh, is the most natural relationship between two parties. Uh, why would a regional security framework without the US between let's say these three, or even a partnership with China, not be the most natural security relationship between these three countries if the economics tells you it is the most natural relationship between these three countries? Okay. I think there is two ways to look at that. Uh, Japan lost the war. And Japan somehow could uh, reconstruct its economy and prosper. Prospers. There's two look. One thought is that it was possible because Japan was uh, provided very very peaceful and stable environment under security umbrella of the U.S. You know, look at the sea lane for Middle East. To Tokyo. And also, Japan didn't have to spend so much money, uh, so much energy on Japanese self-defense as much as other countries does do. Second thought is that uh, pure economic kind of way to analyze. Japan could, uh, Japan made effort and Japan the industry policy and so on. Uh, Japanese economic policy and industry policy trade policy worked very well and helped Japan to develop. But I think that without US, strong US security umbrella, I don't think Japan could prosper as much as we do now. So uh, if China, so I agree, uh, economic relation with China is very important, but is it sustainable 
in long run without security umbrella in, in which Japan could trade and do commerce with China freely without any anxiety about political anxiety or security anxiety. I'm not so sure. So Japan doesn't, I think that uh, Japan cannot sacrifice. Japan cannot, how can I say? Even if Japan wants to maintain cross economic cooperation trade with China, but security relationship with the US is very important. So dilemma now is that as long as US-China relation is stable, Japan doesn't have to choose side, neither side. Well, Japan is taking a side of the US, but in a political, way, in a political level. But now, uh, US and China uh, seemingly getting into a long-term strategic competition. So Japan will fa is facing more serious choice on the Huawei. But Japan made a decision to exclude Huawei from 5G. But next one is maybe entity list. Uh, entity list, you know, yeah, US is uh, you know, putting a sanction on many Chinese companies. So to how much extent Japan will follow US. That was the question of yours. Uh, but I think that after all, Japan will, as long as plan A or plan A dash is sustainable, Japanese choice is to make utmost effort to follow US. Sorry, I'm not so sure uh, clearly I answered your question, but that is my thought. All, all the way in the back, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Kevin Mayer with NMB Consulting, formerly of the State Department. Um, in terms of Plan A and Plan B2, the hedgehog, seems at the operational level, a lot of the requirements and capabilities Japan needs to get, like, like as you mentioned, uh, surface-to-ship capability or long-range counter-strike, either way you go, it's the same capabilities. But I agree, Plan A is probably where we're going, but assuming we are sticking to the alliance Plan A, there's some issues coming up in procurement that could send signals one way or the other on Japanese thinking. Most analysts agree in terms of numbers, we need to be beyond interoperability to be networked and really integrated with our capabilities to counter the numbers the Chinese have. But in things like developing, enhancing integrated air and missile defense, or more importantly, a decision coming up in the next, it would probably maybe by the end of this year or next year, your future fighter with now that you can do um, two questions, now that you can do collective self-defense, you think Japan will get integrated with U.S. forces to the point of commonality of systems and, as I said, more than interoperability, but real integration and data links and integrated fire control really is what we're talking about. Is that politically possible? Or, and do you think that's the way Japan will go or will Japan try to develop a independent fighter capability, somewhat independent, not totally, obviously? Thank you. So question is more indigenous defense capability or interoperability? In the political part. Yeah, yeah, political part, yeah. okay. <coughs> uh, first of all, uh, as uh, Kevin-san uh, mentioned, what the Japan should do for, to enhance plan A option and also plan B2 hedgehog option, there's a lot of overlapping domain. Anyway, Japan have to be strong enough to defend Japan. But as you said, uh, there's two way. One is to enhance, invest more to enhance interoperability. In other words, invest more to Japanese capability to work together with the US more efficiently and so on. Or the other way is invest more for Japan's, not independent necessarily, but autonomous defense capability. So there's two different. And logically thinking, if we know that US-Japan security, security Alliance will last forever or for a long term, time, we should invest 100% on this interoperability because it is efficient. Redundancy is not so efficient. But if we are not so sure about 10 years or 20 years, we sure not about the US, US. Japan is willing to you know, maintain, I think, but the US uh, approach. Then we should 
allocate some of the budget to this hedgehog option. So question is, what is the big mix? What is the best balance between this investment and this investment? And at, at present, I go back to fighters development. At present, I think Japan tried to do dual hedge. 50% on this, or maybe 60% or 40%, and then also here, because we don't know. So kind of like a dual hedge approach. Um, but at the same time, uh, maybe I think it is a good idea to invest more to this domain because if Japan can defend itself by its own, especially like Southwest Island chain by its own, it will free up US burden so that US can use that capability to other regions. So this could also enhance plan A sustainability. So in that sense, investing a little bit more on this domain is not a bad idea, I think. For also for plan A option. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Hubbard, I think this will be the last, uh, last one. You have, a, you have a microphone coming behind you. Tom Hubbard, a retired diplomat and, uh, and currently at McClarty Associates in Washington. Um, just kind of working through your, your frameworks, and, and I'm one of those who uh, am trying to find ways to help the Japanese and Koreans get along with each other better and cooperate more effectively. Uh, it seems to me that you sort of left Korea out of uh, uh, Plan A dash. You talked about Indo-Pacific really talked about Australia and, and India. You, you didn't really talk much about ASEAN. But if you're trying to sort of supplement and enhance the bilateral reliance on the United States, uh, it seems that Korea, where one of the things you share with South Korea is an alliance with the United States. And uh, one of the things Korea has is a very strong economy and very large military. It seems to me that you know the questions about the United States in some ways ought to be trying to move Japan closer to Korea uh, rather than apart. That's a, uh, a comment, I guess a question. What do you think of that thought? Thank you very much for pointing out that <laughs> I might have missed South Korea in this context. Uh, actually, I didn't have that intention. You know, <laughs> I, but I paid more attention to maritime a compet strategic competition in a maritime domain. So maybe that's why I didn't mention so much about ROK. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry about that. But I, of course, I think that it is very important that uh, for Japan also uh, to that Korean Peninsula will be the sphere of democratic influence, democracy, inf the sphere of the uh, influence of democracy. If North Korea, if South Korean Peninsula alone will get dominated by autocrats, or you know, unified by possibly North Korea, is a nightmare. So, not only on the maritime context, but also for geopolitical context, it is very important for Japan and ROK to cooperate with each other. And I think that Abe administration, uh, in this respect, understand this strategic importance and made the effort together with the US to maintain G Somia. G Somia. And I'm very I'm very relieved to you know uh, hear the news that uh, Korea made a, a same decision, it made the same strategic calculation. So I totally agree with you and thank you for pointing out. Thank you. All right, uh, that just about, just about wraps up the panel, yeah. but now for my most important question. Uh, your <laughs> prediction of three sports in which Japan will take uh, gold in the Summer Olympics. Oh, you mean I have to race? Yeah, yeah you have to. Uh, yeah. Maybe uh, not by any order, in order. No, order. No, yeah. no order needed. Maybe, you know, uh, swimming and judo and what else? Uh, 
badminton. Yeah, because there was uh, yeah, action. All right. Maybe I should uh, re you know, pick up more, but. Uh, We'll review those predictions next year. Yeah. You please, didn't mention please. sumo. I, yeah. I think sumo is going to be included. Oh, in the, in the and also summer. karate. Karate. My son is doing karate, so I have to pick up. <laughs> uh, please join me in thanking Aki for Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we'll we'll transition immediately now to the to the uh, final panel. Or, uh, Two fifteen. The next, the final panel of the day will begin. So you have a few minutes to stretch your legs and maybe grab. Right. Thank you, Akitasan and Ryan. Uh, Two fifteen. We will reconvene. Um, and we've got a uh, China, North Korea, um, international trade. We've got a lot of issues to talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect lead in, I think, to the to the afternoon as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that was great. Thank you. いや、ちょうどだ。あ、そうですか。はい。今度始まったことにします。あ、そうですね。そうですね。よろしくお願いします。すいません。今回ごめんなさい。おいやいや。あ。あ、あ。あ、あ。あ、あ。あ、あ。あ、あ。あ、あ。あ、あ。あ、あ
Okay, everyone, I think uh, everyone can uh, take their seats again. We'll get started with our final panel of the day. Feel free, if you're in the back, to move up. Some seats have opened up, so uh, come up closer. Make it, uh, make it nice and cozy. We've got a full uh, plate of issues and a great group of people to discuss. I'm going to turn it over to Jim Zumwalt here in a sec second. And... Uh, you can go to, um, we'll take the 90 minutes, so then we'll end at, at 345, because you have a lot of people to, to weigh in here. So thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, I know it's, uh, we had a, a wonderful session so far, and I wanted to again thank uh, uh, Carnegie uh, Institute for hosting, co-hosting with the Japan American Society this event. Um, it, this has been a nice tradition, I guess the seventh year we've done this, and I hope you've all found it uh, useful as well. Um, we've assembled a really interesting panel uh, today. Uh, we're going to be focusing on uh, pivoting a little bit from Japanese domestic policy to Japanese foreign policy. And so we've assembled an array of experts uh, on Asia. Um, Patricia Kim, who's senior policy analyst with the China program at USIP, and I'm going to be asking her uh, to kick things off on, uh, on Japan-China relations. Uh, because we have some exciting uh, or interesting developments coming up there. Uh, then I'll ask uh, Scott um, Snyder to talk about Japan's relationship with both Koreas, which I think will be uh, quite interesting. We've had a lot of discussion this morning about Japan-South Korea relations, but um, very interested in your thoughts on both of those two issues. And then I'll ask uh, Kristen uh, Vikasi, who's assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and School of Policy and International Affairs at University of Maine. Thank you for coming down for this event today. And you know, an important part of Japanese foreign policy is its international economic policy. And so if you could maybe focus a little bit in your comments on how Japan is looking at Asia Pacific, but also relations with the US from the perspective of advancing its economic interests and what are some of the things we might be looking out for. And then finally, uh, uh, our cleanup hitter will be uh, Musashi Murano, the Japan chair at the Hudson Institute. And I'm hoping you can focus a little bit on the bilateral US-Japan relationship, particularly from the security side. Uh, thank you very much. So without, so maybe I'll ask Patty to start. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And um, I just want to uh, thank the Carnegie Endowment as well as the Japan American Society for uh, inviting me here today. It's really a pleasure to be here on this panel with all of these excellent scholars. Um, so on your question on Japan-China relations, where is it going? So let me start by noting that Japan-China relations has been on the rise, and it's looking much more positive um, than it did. If you compare it to the state of relations in the 2010s, um, when you first, you know, uh, when, it's, when there was a downturn that really started with a collision of a Japanese a uh, Coast Guard ship and a Chinese trawler in September 2010 uh, near the disputed territories uh, that Japan calls Senkaku and China calls the Diaoyu Islands. And there was another spike in tensions, or the tensions really grew from there when China declared an ADIZ, or Air Defense Identification Zone, in 2013 in response to what it saw as, China, as Japan's nationalization of these islands. Um, so really since then, you know, the, the relationship was not at a good place. And then things began to thaw around 2017 when pri uh, with Prime Minister Abe visiting Japan, or excuse me, China for the first time in 2018, marking the first visit by a top Japanese leader since 2011. Um, and since then, there's been a number of exchanges between the two sides. And most recently, you saw the Prime Minister in Chengdu along with his uh, South Korean and Chinese counterparts. Uh, for a trilateral. 
Now, since the warming of relations, uh, Japanese and Chinese leaders have been talking about a new era in bilateral relations. And there are reports in the media that the two sides are considering signing some sort of fifth political document uh, in time to, for, in time, um, timing with Xi Jinping's first state visit to Japan, probably uh, in April of this year. And this document, you know, there's a lot of speculation what could be in it, but um, essentially what we've seen in the media is that the document will outline how the two states can cooperate on regional and global efforts for uh, peace and stability. So I wanna just go into, you know, what precipitated this uptick in relations and how deep or sustainable is this thaw? Um, first, I think there's no doubt that the rise of the Trump administration and the America First policy towards both China and Japan sort of sparked both sides to look around uh, in their neighborhood. Um, for China, the US-China trade war and what looks like a long-term hardline shift in US policy towards China precipitated a lot of anxiety in Beijing and drove home the point that China needs to stabilize its other relationships, given the fact that it will probably be in this long-term um, competitive relationship with the United States. In Japan, I think President Trump's rhetoric, uh, dis disparaging alliances, his call for allies to pay more, and his desire to correct what he saw as imbalances in trade relationships with both allies and non-allies alike uh, really spooked people and um, also, uh, President Trump's withdrawal from the TPP uh, was a big blow to Prime Minister Abe, who had really sold this as a means to strengthen the Japanese economy and keep the United States economically engaged in East Asia. So I think all of these recent developments underscored the urgency for Tokyo and Beijing to shore up their relationships. Uh, but I want to note that beyond just the Trump factor that's played out in the last three to four years, there's also a long-standing recognition in Tokyo and Beijing that given their geographical proximity, their economic interdependence, um, it's, it's really unrealistic not to engage one another. So if you look back in the history of Sino-Japanese relations, this has always been the case. So even in the first half of the Cold War, um, the two sides were looking for ways to economically cooperate, um, and, and Japan really wanted to normalize relations with China um, because it felt like that, you know, that was the realistic thing to do, but it really couldn't until Nixon went to China, and as soon as that happened, the two states normalized relations in 72. Um, and again, in 1989, following the Tiananmen Square um, Tiananmen Square repression, you know, when China was isolated in the world, Japan was one of the first countries to sort of re-engage with China um, and to, to make the case that it's better to engage with them than to keep them isolated. Um, so there's this important recognition, there's this important sort of pragmatism that underpins the relationship that is driving this thaw, I think, that is beyond just uh, the Trump administration. Now, um, thinking about you know, what's ahead in this summit, it's not really clear uh, what will be in this new fifth joint document. Um, but again, I think um, you know, from what we've seen in the media, you know, talking about this document guiding cooperation between the two countries on regional and global issues, it again reflects this recognition in Japan that China is here to stay. It will remain uh, for the long term engaged in the global arena. And so rather to ignore that or to shun it, it's better to get with them and try to shape what they're doing in a more productive um, direction. Now, having said that, um, I think there are sharp limits to, um, to where this rapprochement can go. And there are several factors that remain barriers. Um, first and foremost, I think it's the US-Japan alliance you know, it's a key pillar of, uh, of Japan's national security strategy. And while Japan doesn't want to have to choose between uh, the United States or China, if there's a war, you know, it's pretty clear that Japan would side with the United States. And I think China recognizes this. Um, you know, I think it recognizes that Washington and Tokyo are very much aligned on the threat that is posed by China's military expansion. And, that, and they also are aligned on the need to balance against uh, this rising threat. And so Beijing understands this very well, and I don't think it sees Tokyo as one of the soft targets that it can woo away from the US-led alliance network like it sees some other countries in the neighborhood. Um, and I think you know, China has and will continue to vigorously oppose any efforts by Japan uh, to take on a greater security role in the alliance or to strengthen its own military. 
Um, and, and of course, as everyone here well knows, the two countries also have you know, a very serious outstanding territorial dispute in the East China Sea that probably will not be resolved anytime soon. And so even, even though relations have been warmed, this is one issue area where both sides have expressed that they're not going to compromise. And you see that the Chinese have actually stepped up their efforts to assert their sovereignty over these islands. Um, I, from what I understand, last year was uh, one of the highest rates of Chinese incursions into what Japan considers uh, its EEZ. Uh, another barrier to deepened uh, or very deep alignment between the two countries is just this deep suspicion of China's intentions within uh, Japan among, and among Japanese citizens. So if you look at polling data, you know, Japan as well as South Korea often are on the most negative end of the spectrum on how they view China. And, you know, and I think a lot of this comes from um, historical reasons as well as this fundamental disconnect in values and norms that pose a, a serious limit to real policy coordination. Uh, so to wrap up, I think Japan and China's relationship this year and in the foreseeable future will essentially remain lukewarm. Um, it's not gonna get too hot, it's not gonna get too cold. There will be political engagement based on pragmatism, but again, there are limits to deep cooperation or alignment. Now, I think some ways the relationship might be thrown off track is if there's some sort of um, you know, accidental escalation in the East China Sea. But there's strong will, I think, in both capitals right now to keep this rapprochement going. And so I think that will serve as a restraint against some sort of flare up. And there's also discussions about pursuing you know, crisis mechanisms and so on, which is a positive thing. And finally, um, I think, you know, I, I think China, and, and this serves as probably the biggest restraint. China is not seeking a war anytime soon. It doesn't want to engage in a military clash with Japan or the United States. It's dealing with you know, so many issues at home from Hong Kong to Xinjiang to this newest viral outbreak. Um, you know, it wants to keep up its economic development, keep up its growth rates. It needs to show progress on BRI and all of these ambitious initiatives that it's put out there. And so I think this will serve as a stabilizing factor in the Ch Japan-China relationship for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Okay, now we'll turn to Scott to talk about the two Koreas. Okay, uh, well, thanks, Jim. Thanks to both Jims uh, and to the Carnegie uh, Endowment and Japan America Society of Washington, D.C. for uh, hosting this. And um, so by my count, uh, so far, uh, there's been one question that has been asked three times today. What about South Korea? Uh, and so I want to try to you know, answer that, but I'm actually going to do it by deviating from my uh, instructions a little bit because I want to broaden out. Uh, one area that I'm interested in right now is um, how do Japan and South Korea fit in the context of the free and open Indo-Pacific? Uh, and so I want to make a couple of observations about that and then get into uh, North Korea and then say something about Japan-South Korea relations. Uh, because um, Assistant Secretary Stilwell referenced free and open Indo-Pacific, of course, and referenced the Japanese framing of that. Uh, and really, if you go back and look at uh, Prime Minister Abe's speech in 2016 and his description of free and open Indo-Pacific, um, it's hard to say that, in my view, that the U.S. has necessarily added much uh, to uh, the specifics uh, that Prime Minister Abe put forward. Uh, an emphasis on standard setting, uh, economic prosperity, infrastructure, people-to-people -people connectivity, and peace and stability. Um, but then as we think about how the U.S. policy is evolving, there are these other two documents now that I think uh, provide some uh, perceptions of work in progress. And one of them is the U.S.-Japan joint statement on the free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, that was um, issued in November of uh, 2018. Uh, and the other is a joint fact sheet between the US and South Korea just issued last November that also talks about the free and open Indo-Pacific. And so what's really interesting to me as we look at those documents is um, how much they're parallel, how much they even converge. And so if you look at the US-Japan uh, priorities in the um, uh, free and open Indo-Pacific uh, joint statement through energy infrastructure and digital, digital connectivity cooperation. It talks about energy sector development. 
It talks about financing of infrastructure. Um, it, it, it names specific projects. And it talks a lot about standard setting. And then the joint fact sheet from just last November, which, um, so the interesting question that uh, I'm sure that our colleagues in Japan and South Korea will look closely at is, well, what's the difference between a joint statement and a joint fact sheet? Uh, and how do we measure uh, the relative comparison? Well, I don't know the answer to that, but what I can say is that um, in the U.S.-South Korea joint fact sheet issued on the sidelines of the East Asia Summit, the emphasis was on uh, prosperity, um, and that was uh, um, describing cooperation in energy, infrastructure, and development finance, and digital economy. Sounds a lot like what came out the previous year. Uh, in the U.S.-Japan joint statement. Uh, people, talking about investment in human capital, and we heard a lot about that from Assistant Secretary Stilwell, uh, and peace, uh, and uh, their uh, discussions about water management, maritime security, um, uh, HADR, uh, strengthening of law enforcement. So in a way, I think the main difference is that um, the issue of standard setting in the U.S.-Japan statement was kind of upfront the standard setting in the U.S.-Korea document was kind of embedded uh, in some of the practical cooperation. But my point in going through all of this is, uh, isn't it remarkable how in the context of the U.S. framework, um, maybe this A dash scenario that Hero put forward, um, how much it looks like Japan's and South Korean respective interests are parallel if not convergent. Um, However, we know, I think, that in the context of free and open Indo-Pacific, you know, the subtext or the missing piece is about respective views of China, where Japan and South Korea seem to have very different approaches from each other. And I think that those approaches are related to primarily uh, geography, uh, preferred modes of engagement, uh, balancing versus accommodation on the South Korean side, uh, and relative dependency on China to achieve core strategic objectives. And of course, that's North Korea. Um, and so in some ways, I'm tempted to think, okay, well, what we're really dealing with in the context of the free and open Indo-Pacific is something more akin to uh, American, Japanese, and South Korean individuals sitting in a room but who have different preferences about what is the temperature in the room. Uh, uh, some have a colder, uh, a desire for a colder room, and some have a desire for a warmer room. And so I'm just kind of um, suggesting that those are parallel, but, there's, but there are differences. North Korea, um, historically trilateral cooperation has been critical. Uh, as we have thought about engaging North Korea, uh, it goes back to 1998, the Trilateral uh, Coordination and Oversight Group that Secretary Perry set up. Um, but, uh, as again with our lunch presentation, uh, interestingly, uh, on the one hand, as North Korea's capacity to project threat has grown, ironically, it seems like it's generating opportunities for North Korea to play off different parties against each other. And this really gets to perceptions of extended deterrence and the credibility of extended deterrence. It's also related to how the U.S. deals with those issues. And so I would just focus on, on that uh, question and the, basically the risk that North Korea can play a nuclear blackmail game in ways that can divide uh, the US, Japan, and South Korea. And then coming back to Japan and South Korea, which of course is really the nub of the issue. Uh, and we've heard basically today how uh, Japan looks past South Korea, but South Korea does not raise its hand uh, when it comes to looking for opportunities for cooperation. The core issues there, I think, really revolve around three issues. The deepest is an identity issue uh, related to um, how each side sees the other um, and uh, a desire by uh, South Koreans to look to the past versus the future. There's also, I think, um, a, an issue that has gotten less attention uh, that uh, I think complicates things, uh, and that's the ideology issue. Um, it's hard to think of a stable Japan-South Korea relationship when South Korea is led by progressive administrations. And so I think we have to ask ourselves why. 
that is the case. Uh, and I think a third overlay in the case of, of, of Moot and Abe may be that it's a kind of personality challenge. It doesn't seem to be much chemistry there. And so my final point is that, um, again, from a US perspective, as we look at things that we can do to manage this relationship, historically, actually, uh, on the spectrum between geopolitical realism and identity-driven conflict, the US at the very beginning put its thumb on the scale in favor of geopolitical realism when it helped to establish an environment where Japan and South Korea could normalize the relationship. I think that what we've learned over the course of the past six to nine months is that um, the US still has an interest in putting its finger on the scale because um, the assumption underlying the US-led security architecture is that J Japanese and South Korean security interests are indivisible from each other. And what that means is that the US, it's in the US interest to oppose decoupling, whether it comes in the form of South Korea leaving GSOMIA, uh, or uh, whether it comes in the context of economic moves that turn the glue that had been supporting the security relationship for so long into a solvent. Uh, and so that's where I would conclude from a US perspective um, it's really important for uh, Japanese and South Korean security interests and therefore the economic interests to be conceived of as uh, indivisible from each other. And I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Now we'll go to uh, Chris. Thanks so much for having me today. Um, I <coughs> took my, my assignment here. I'm going to talk about Japan's goals moving forward over the next year from a a government perspective and also kind of talk about private sector goals, um, particularly thinking about the large Japanese international businesses and their associations. Um, so it's, it's been interesting listening to the discussion today, thinking about sort of this glue that might hold the region together. And you know, we have a gravity model of trade. And that gravity model of trade says that these large vibrant markets that are really close to each other are going to Right, trade a lot with each other, have a lot of investment with each other, and sort of have perhaps complementary and occasionally competitive, or often, maybe often competitive interests. But we don't have a gravity model of um, political alliances. And that it's, it's not, in fact, typically, historically, it's not natural to have neighbors have very close political alliances. And that's something that needs to be built. And there is a fund some fundamental shared economic interest that might provide um, a, a stage for those to be built upon. But, it, but, they, but that's not a given, right? That's something that needs to be actively uh, developed. Uh, Japan, it, it, uh, recently, the last, last couple of decades, uh, economic statecraft and diplomacy has been a place where the Japanese government is more comfortable acting internationally than other forms of, of statecraft. And in particular, they, right, there's been a pursuit of formalized rulemaking, um, a strong support of the World Trade Organization, dispute settlement mechanism uh, system, and Japan moving forward um, really wants to be a multilateral rule maker. And we see, and, and, that's, and that point is key to what I think we should look for as we look forward into 2020. Um, so there's sort of two main points. So thinking from the government, um, the, the government perspective that Japan's going to continue to pursue multilateral economic integration. I'll unpack that a little bit in a minute um, in the Indo-Pacific at, while at the same time deepening bilateral relations with the US. And, right, so you can already see there's a little bit of a tension here pursuing multilateral rulemaking on the one hand and bilateral rulemaking um, with one of uh, Japan's most important economic and, of course, security partners, the United States. So there's this bilateral trade deal that came into effect January 1st. It's a really big deal. Um, after all these years, right, we got a trade deal. Um, it lowers tariffs, right? This is, it's about tariffs, and it's about tariffs and goods, largely. Um, and particularly for some, some big wins for the US with agricultural products, it's pretty much in line with what the United States would have gotten through the TPP minus some stuff. Um, but there's also this uh, digital trade agreement, which is also a really big step forward and is a long-term uh, goal of, Japan, of um, the Japanese trade policymakers to start to build digital rules in a multilateral context. And so here, this is done bilaterally, but, but there's hopes that this might become somewhat of a template moving forward. 
On the private sector side, um, the private sector is trying to respond to sort of contradictory trends that are happening. So on the one hand, right, there's this move towards deeper multilateral economic integration. Um, for t and there, there are some possibilities in 2020 for further institutionalization in the Indo-Pacific region. Actually, not the Indo-Pacific region, the Asia-Pacific region without India. Um, in this particular case. Uh, uh, but at the same time, we see Japanese leadership and the Abe administration sort of threatening some of the deeper inter economic integration with close partners, particularly with Korea, um, with recent trade restrictions. Um, and, uh, and, and, I, and I can speak to that later if people, if people are interested. But I, but I won't with this time for the interest of time. Um, OK. So Japan's long-term goal um, for the last couple of decades has had to have 70% of their trade covered by high-quality multilateral trade institutions. So what does high-quality mean for the Japanese government? It's not just tariff reduction. Um, in particular, they want to address core economic concerns, particularly those articulated by the, by the large multinational uh, business community like Kedan Rep. Right? So these are the concerns articulated there. Um, so these are things like protecting intellectual property rights, um, trying to prohibit forced technology, transfer, um, having shared production and manufacturing standards across borders, and so you have these very multilateral integrated supply chains, and you can have the same ISO standards um, across all of those. It makes it much easier for these companies to do this. Why does the multilateral trading system, why do the institutions need to be multilateral? Well, because the business is multilateral, right? You want a match that way. Um, and perhaps also some shared environmental and labor standards, although those are, are secondary. They also want trade agreements that contain ways to solve the disputes that inevitably rise. Even among close friends, you might have arguments about what the rules actually mean. So you want dispute settlement mechanisms, things like the WTO court, for example, or perhaps investor state uh, dispute settlement mechanisms, ISDS systems, where companies can seek redress outside of a domestic court system when they think they might, might not get a fair say there. Um, so thinking about this 70% goal, Japan, depending on how you define high quality, is going to probably reach this goal in 2020. And this will happen um, through the, for movement on the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, um, because it will bring, it will bring, uh, um, so they already have an agreement with ASEAN, but it will bring um, ASEAN and uh, China and Korea into a multilateral trade agreement. Unfortunately, RCEP well, doesn't include India. Um, so India, pro it, it looks all signs point to India is not going to sign. Um, so that's it's outside of the Indo-Pacific region, and it also doesn't contain a lot of the things, the kind of aspects that would make it a a high quality trade agreement as as uh, articulated by Japan. In particular, it doesn't address IP um, intellectual property rights in the way that they like, and it doesn't contain strong dispute settlement mechanisms. Either, by the way, does the US-Japan trade agreement. We don't, we don't have a way to solve our, our inevitable arguments via that, that agreement. However, this is, this is over a decade in the making, and there's a good chance it will be signed this year. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, pretty, that's a pretty big deal. Um, it will reduce tariffs on somewhere around 80-ish, 80 to 85% of goods. Um, it's not quite as high as they would like, but it's, it's a big step forward. Uh, the business community also has these perennial notes of optimism, including this December, that there'll be a China-Korea-Japan free trade agreement. This has been going on for about 15 years, and there's, they're always optimistic, including this December. Their statement on it was very optimistic. I'm skeptical, but keep your eyes out for that. Um, from the perspective of the private sector, um, the, the they're a little, the, the Keidanran uh, and um, to some extent Keizai Doyukai has also made some noises, are a little bit less happy with the Japanese government's um, um, advocacy work for their free and, inter uh, free and open um, internationalization than they would like, in particular with the whitelist issue with South Korea and some other moves that there's maybe not quite as much of support for an op open, liberal, global globalization as, as they would like. So they're trying to sort of balance their advocacy and their desire for these very high quality trade agreements that will protect their intellectual property, um, uh, address in, industrial subsidy issues, things like that, um, while also trying not to 
make some of these political tensions that have been affecting business any worse. Um, the Japanese private sector faces in the region right, much more explicitly political risks than the United States faces in the region. Um, think when there are political tensions, they do tend to bleed into, into economics, particularly with China, but also recently with South Korea. So there are these real challenges that the private sector is facing, and having the Abe government perhaps be more of an advocate for, for liberalization would be was sort of on their wish list. Um, and so that's that's something we could we can look out for. Um, sort of in in uh, and actually, yeah, no, I'll, I'll leave it right there. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you very much. So now we'll turn to Asashi to try and tie all this together. <laughs> and how, uh, particularly, how Japan is looking at the United States and what it hopes to see from us in the next year. All right. So thank you very much, Ambassador. The, the before the starting to the, my the, uh, initial uh, uh, presentations, I would like to great thanks to the Carnegie Endowment and the uh, uh, Japan American Society of Med uh, uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, so to think about that the U.S.-Japan, specifically security relationships, the U.S.-Japan uh, bilateral relationship, is, it is not independent variables. So in that reason, I'd like to start the assessing the very briefly, the, uh, assessing the security environment, what we face. So, so I'd like to the looking at the, the positive and negative aspect of the security environment facing Japan. So let's start to think about the positive aspect uh, from uh, of the our security environment. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately, that uh, from the positive aspect, so as already there are some uh, previous some number of the previous speakers. The, such as the Akita san and Patricia and the Scott. The, for instance, that as for the North Korea, the military tension has eased since the 2017s. The, however, in the meantime, the North Korea's denuclearization has made no progress at all, unfortunately. And the North Korea uh, is continuing to upgrading not only their long range missile, but also uh, their short-range and medium-range missile capabilities, which uh, are cap uh, capable of attacking Japan, not only Japan, but also uh, South Korea. Uh, so some of them may be revealed at the coming military parade of next month. And the, my boss, the, uh, my current position is the Japan chair fellow. Uh, now, so I'm working with the General McMasters, who is the former uh, national security advisor, uh, he was one of the person who considered to all options uh, for the North Korea in the uh, in the, uh, the current uh, Trump administrations. The, uh, to be clear, that I'm not uh, going to the, the emphasis on the, the military options, but all, but at the, at the same time, the absence of the conflict or military options is not necessarily a good situation for us. What I mean by this is, that giving North Korea. Uh, moratorium it could be a bigger risk to to to, to us uh, than uh, it is now. So for how do we comparing to the current risk to uh, avoiding to the same the escalations? The how so how do we balance the current risk uh, calculation the current risk or the risk of the in the future? Uh, so so how, how about China? What about China? At the current situation, Japan-China relationship is improving. The, as few as number of the previous speaker also already mentioned about, the, in this year, the President Xi Jinping is scheduled to the visit Japan as a state guest. Uh, however, now looking at looking at the some specific uh, situation, for instance, in the East China Sea, uh, the activities of the Chinese Chinese Coast Guard and the PLA Navy and PLA Air Force have become increasingly active rather than the restraint. So in other words, even if Japan-China uh, Japan -China diplomatic relations improved, uh, China's behavior is ir irrelevant. So in that reason, in this way, the security environment facing Japan and facing US-Japan alliance is deteriorating day to day. So therefore, uh, it is clear that the U.S.-Japan alliance must be the further strengthen. So the next question is that how do we further strengthen our alliance? 
So it has been almost the five years. Uh, what I mean by this, in uh, five years ago, the U.S. Japan uh, government uh, has been has revised our uh, U.S. Japan uh, defense uh, cooperation guidelines. But after that, the Trump administration has taken over, and the, we have both reviewed the major defense strategies. In case of the United States, the, in 2017, end of the 2017, uh, national security strategy released, and after the, uh, one month later, uh, national defense strategy uh, released, and uh, they also released that uh, nuclear posture review and the missile defense review. And on the, on the other hand, in case of Japan, the, as Akira-san mentioned, the Ministry of Defense uh, revised that our strategic document, so-called National Defense Program Guideline, or NDPG. It is a capstone document for our defense strategies. Uh, there, these kind of the strategic documents uh, are mutually uh, compatible, the strate uh, strategic documents in which Japan and the United States are uh, basically in the same directions. But the, we had uh, some lack of the considering, some, some lack of uh, thinking of this document. The first one is how we define our strategic objectives in the long-term strategic competition era. The, it also paraphrasing that the, how to compete with China. The China has a clear a cellular of victory uh, to use the asymmetric capabilities, a form of anti-access of and area denial the capabilities, and say the dominance uh, uh, domains of us and uh, the prevent of the U.S. interventions. But Japan, even the United States, uh, don't have our equivalent blue cell of victory. So in particular, uh, we needed to be more serious that Japan uh, overwhelmingly the disadvantage to China in terms of, in terms of resources. Uh, for, for example, the, the 2018 latest version National Defense Program guideline emphasizes the investment in the new domain, such as the space, cyber, and electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, I think that this, it, it is good things. However, that other programs has unclear that, prior, that, that priorities. So we no, we no longer the, have the superiority against China in all domains. So when I so read to the, this strategic document, I remember that the, the other strategic document, the Joint Vision 2020, it's released by the, from the uh, US, U.S. Department of Defense in, the 20, in 2000. This document, the emphasis of the importance of the uh, maintaining the full spectrum dominance. But seeking to the full spectrum dominance, is not, it is not a strategy. The strategy is the prioritizing to the, our defense portfolio. So in that reason, the US-Japan alliance should start to narrow down the areas, areas and the programs to focus on. What, what is the, our priorities? So related to this context, the, we should redefine our common strategic objectives in order to use common analysis method to prioritize our limited defense portfolio. Uh, since uh, uh, September 11, the U.S. defense strategy has been focused on the global war on terror. But now, uh, I, again, it is the era of the strategic competition. So in line of, with this, that we should consider uh, common strategic objectives and redefine uh, our roles, missions, and multi-domain joint capabilities of U.S. forces and uh, our JSDF. The specifically, uh, what element do we expect the SDF, the self-defense forces, to acquire, for instance, more longer-range strike capabilities? And even for, as an example, is the hosting to the U.S. ground missiles, ground-based missiles in Japan. In con those kind of capabilities to perform, in conjunction with the Allied Integrated Missile Defense. So we should consider to the, uh, how to be, that, how do we identify to the appropriate mix our Allied uh, 
uh, offensive and defensive capabilities. And second is that we, we need to think about the regional impact of the review of the U.S. forward deployment posture. The, in my understanding, the just, just yesterday, the uh, secretary expert a uh, little bit mentioned about the possibility to really start into the, those kind of the review process. In my understanding, it is the equivalent of the Global Posture Review 2.0. Uh, so the concern is here. The concern is that the relocation of existing bases is becoming more complex. So in the, pre, the, morning, in the morning sessions, somebody already pointed out and they're asking the Q&A Q sessions about the, of course, including the FTEM relocation facility issues, but also it's not only in case of Japan, but also the, uh, in, in case of Korea, uh, sometimes faced on the same problems. So realignment of the U.S. forces in Japan, including the South Korea and Okinawa, and was part of the transformations and the global posture review process uh, in the, under the Bush administrations. So if this is a review to prepare the, for the strategic competitions, the, the existing base relocation plan may be reviewed. So that is one of the, the, the embodied to the some uh, political complexities. And finally, the, I'd like to mention the uh, command and control structure in this region. Uh, so as we know that the U.S.-Japan alliance does not have the single integrated operational command structures, uh, such as U.S. ROK alliance and U.S. Na uh, NATO alliance, uh, is Japan is not informed the, for, the, for this re reason. Uh, Japan is not informed of the details of the U.S. military operations, including the U.S. Uh, bases in Japan, uh, nor it is it shared what kind of operational plan. Uh, U.S. ROK alliance have. So these kind of the black box like the situation might have been unavoidable in the in the 1950s or, or 1990s when Korean War happens and the Taiwan crisis breaking out. So in other words, the alliance coordination systems in which Japan support to the military operations of the United States or the U.S. ROK alliance. Uh, was based on the, uh, the fundamentals that is the Japan is the, the safe staging area. However, this assumption no longer exists due to the improved missile capabilities of China and North Korea. So given that Japan faced significant risk is supporting U U.S. operation and U.S. ROK alliance. So in that reason that the command and control mechanism in this region should be redesigned. Uh, to appropriate, appropriately reflect Japan's burden and risk. So in 2020s, in this year, the U.S.-Japan will have to negotiate to the host nation support issues, but this is no longer two issues that can be solved to handle to the just money issues. So this, this should, it should be including to the, in the discussion of the strategic concept of the entire U.S.-Japan alliance based on the all elements of I, I just dimensions. No, thank you very much. It was very thoughtful, and uh, uh, I'm still trying to digest all the <laughs> comments you made. Um, if I could maybe turn back to um, China and just ask uh, Patty a question. Um, you mentioned uh, that there were sharp limits to how much the rapprochement between Japan and China could be. Both sides are realistic, but there were some fundamental differences. So if you were um, predicting what sorts of discussions the Japanese prime minister and the Chinese leader will have, uh, during the state visit, do you think the Japanese side would raise the issue, some of the sharp limit type issues like the tensions of Japanese scholars in China or treatment of Uyghurs or uh, the status of Hong Kong? And likewise, do you think that the Chinese side would raise uh, restrictions on Japanese investment by Chinese companies like Huawei in Japan, some of these really tough issues? And if so, how do you think they might deal with some of these issues? Um, so hard to say with the latter, but definitely I'm sure those will be on the table and there have already been calls you know, within Japan, for instance, why are we having this state visit because of these outstanding issues? We have um, Japanese nationals detained. You know, the, are we endorsing what's going on in Hong Kong and Xinjiang? So there's certainly concern and there's been a recognition by Japanese leaders that these issues need to be addressed you know, before and during the summit. Um, in terms of um, you know, how are they going to solve them? I, it's hard to say. 
Um, but thinking about sort of what, would, what might be on the agenda, more broadly speaking, and zooming out, um, I think you'll see probably a lot more emphasis on sort of bilateral cooperation on economic development in the region and beyond. Um, so you've seen some of this, uh, you've seen previews of this, for instance, at the trilateral and commitments by Japan, South Korea, and China to work uh, for their development banks to work with ASEAN, for instance, on infrastructure, financing, and so on. And so I think you might see these sorts of things on the uh, agenda at the summit. And of course, you know, China has been very eager to, um, to win Japan's endorsement of BRI and its support of China's role. And so I think those sorts of uh, items will also be on the agenda as well. So really focusing on the areas where there might be win-win outcomes or positive progress. I would think those would be highlighted, but certainly I think both sides would, would be eager to mention, you know, these are the core interests or the core concerns that we have and make sure that's on the record. But I don't really know how a summit would resolve many of these issues. Um, and if I could turn just to Scott for a second. You mentioned, you know, identity issues as one of the big challenges in ROK Japan relations. And I wonder if it might be fair to say on the Korean side, identity issues are the challenge. And on the Japanese side, I don't know if it's so much fundamental to their identity as it is a lack of recognition of some of the Korean uh, concern about their past history. Um, but is that a fair way to look at it? And if so, do you think the recent, you know, compared to 20 years ago, there's so much more people-to-people -people contact between Japan and Korea, massive flows of tourism, um, Korean TV shows and music are very popular in Japan, uh, you know, makeup on both sides. I mean, there's a lot of more cultural connections than there were 20 years ago. So do you think these identity issues might uh, gradually become less important going forward because of the greater contact between the two? Yeah, that's a great question. So when I talk about identity, in part what I'm talking about is uh, the South Korean insistence on defining Japan's identity in the Korean public dis discourse as pre-war. Uh, and I think that for modern Japanese uh, to be denied uh, the self-identity of a pacifist nation is a nation that has changed. Yeah, from, yeah. yeah it, 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 it's, uh, it's unusual if we step back from a global perspective and from a Japanese perspective, it's easy to see why they might be dissatisfied with the way that Koreans are looking at and defining Japan. So that would be kind of the way that I would frame that when I'm uh, pointing to identity. But really, it's about perceptions of self and other. Uh, that I think have been deeply ingrained and that have kind of failed to be overcome. And so when I think about that, I'm thinking about, well, what would move the needle uh, in terms of changing perceptions uh, on uh, either side uh, of the other? And you're right that we've seen a lot of interchange. And I think that actually at an individual level, we've seen progress. Uh, and in some ways, I feel like uh, it's closer to being um, compartmentalized uh, as an issue between the governments. Uh, but we've also seen setbacks, right, especially over the course of the past year, you know, targeting the two institutional constituencies that have always been ballast for the relationship, the business community and the military community with the um, radar fire lock issue. And, and so, you know, um, uh, even despite that, I do think that there are limits, but it's hard to say. I, I would say it seems variable. If we look at the, um, the boycott issues, for instance, um, uh, and the power of collective opinion, uh, I think it's more limited in a way, but it's still there. And, and also I would say that there's a tendency to attribute the worst uh, to the other side. So if you monitor, I don't know, if you monitor Japanese tourism to you know, South Korea and vice versa. Up until last summer, I would say that it was more a reflection of exchange rate fluctuations, which way the flows were going. Um, you know, um, but prior to last summer, you could also see uh, media uh, gravitating towards the, oh, you know, the tourism numbers are down. They must be upset with this kind of view. Add yes. briefly to that. <clears throat> I think there's, there's so definitely person to person and cultural contact, particularly with the Korean wave things, have increased over the last two decades. 
At the same time, two decades ago, there were more, particularly in Korea, Korean elites, Korean business people that had really close personal ties with J Japanese business people and you know, spoke really great Japanese and they had these very close personal relationships and that has faded somewhat and so there's uh, there's the mechanism of elite leadership from both sides driving the pragmatic economic relationship I think is fading a little bit and that's a cause for concern moving forward even if young people might feel happier about Japanese makeup products or k-pop or whatever there's you still need the leadership and that is is fading a little bit just as this that generation that had those close ties is is getting older um, also, the analysis of, of um, public opinion surveys absolutely shows what you, what um, Scott has pointed out that Koreans, in particular, who are very, who feel very hostile towards um, Japanese political stances or policies, it, that has that has no effect. That doesn't move in the same direction with whether or not they want to buy a Japanese product or whether they want to watch a Japanese movie. So you, you really do see a, a, a cordoning off of these different issues historically in Korea, at least up until through the last maybe six months. And yeah. We'll have to see what happens. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I also have, um, Patricia, a trade question for you. You mentioned Japan on the one hand pursuing a multilateral approach, building uh, rules, supporting the WTO, and on the other hand cutting the best deal they could with the United States, their largest yeah. trading partner, even though that deal was probably WTO inconsistent and in some ways you know, kind of weakens their um, sort of uh, moral authority, if you will, in the WTO. Um, so I, I wonder if you could comment on that, but also um, I'm really interested in your thoughts on how did Japan see the US deals with NAFTA, the successor agreement to NAFTA, and the uh, Japan-China, I'm sorry, the US-China trade agreement, because Japanese business had huge interests at stake in these two agreements, and yet they had no voice in, in the outcome of these two. Right, yeah, absolutely. Um, so. I mean, so Japan's interest with the United States vis-a-vis -vis trade agreements is keep the United States at the table, keep the United States talking, keep the United States engaged. And if and there was they they held out a long time before they entered bilateral negotiations, hoping that the United States would come back to the table with some form of TPP. So that that as time went on, right, that clearly wasn't going to happen. And so they negotiated this trade agreement in a record five months. That's stunning. Um, that was a, very, a stunningly fast trade agreement. Uh, Japan, so, but 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 the United States right remains at the table. We heard we heard this morning it was a phase one agreement. That means there's going to be a phase two. So we're still talking. We'll resolve section two thirty two, et cetera. Right. So that's that's going to go forward. Um, the newly renegotiated NAFTA. There's there's some distress on the Japanese side about that deal because in particular. Autos, yeah, yeah, because of autos and because of content requirements, right? So they really they they upped the uh, local or, or within deal content requirements and country specific things in that agreement, and that's tough for Japanese auto producers in particular. So they they would have preferred some some other outcome there. Um, particularly an outcome that had Japan in the same trading block as the US, Canada, and Mexico, um, as would have happened with um, if it was TPP rather than CPTPP. Um, with re respect to the US-China agreement, um, so Japan is still waiting and seeing, I think, as, the, as the, we all are, of what that is actually going to mean, what phase two of that will mean. The trade tensions have already had some effect on, on regionalization and the way that economic, um, regional economic patterns are going. And so that, that the new US-China trade deal isn't going to change any of those, any of those sort of longer underlying trends. Thank you. And Masashi, I, it's hard for me to ask you one question because mm -hmm. you raised so many issues, <laughs> but I was really intrigued by your comment on um, how there's a need to work together more on command and control issues. And you raised a very good point that Japan is no longer the safe rear, rear area in case of a conflict in Korea. Japan's gonna be on the front lines and involved in a conflict very quickly due to North Korean uh, ability to strike uh, targets in Japan. Um, you know, there has been a lot of discussion within the US, obviously, about the need to modernize the approach. And one of the big constraints, frankly, has been poor Japan-Korea relations 
where USFK has been very reluctant. They have a lot of difficult issues they're trying to work out with their Korean counterparts. So they introduced this Japan issue at a time when Japan-Korea relations are so poor really complicates their life very greatly. And so they're just not sort of eager to take that on, even if it makes sense in a um, sort of strategic sense. But do you think this might come interest Japan in improving relations with Korea as one of the positive potential outcomes that they could become more integrated uh, in, in this kind of a, of a, a approach? Well, so I think that the comp from the context of the comprehensively, com comprehensive relationship between Japan and uh, uh, South Korea is the one of the opportunity to, to improve uh, our the security and the diplomatic relationships, especially uh, in particular the, from the expert communities and not only the expert, but it, it, when I, what I mean by this is experts including to the, the policy practitioners. <coughs> Uh, really uh, recognize the importance of the trilateral cooperation between uh, among three countries, Japan, US, and ROK. But at the same time, I already mentioned about the, the, the realistically the assessing to the, our security environment. The, uh, so it's that command and control structure could be involved, could be improved to the, that more the openly, the ref, uh, reflecting to the Japan's responsibility and risks. So I don't have some clear answer, but uh, one of the possibility is the mutual exchange of the uh, liaison officers, the, because of the as you may know that the Japan still hosting to the, the uh, United Nations Command Rear in Yokota Air Bases. <coughs> uh, that, so in that sense, that if Japan JSDF office, Japanese government uh, dispatched into the as a uh, JSDF officer as a liaison to the Seoul or United Nations Command in Seoul, but uh, instead of this, this uh, in, 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 instead of this, Japan could accept the some ROK officers to the United Nations Command Rear for. Uh, more frequently communicate about how we coordinate with each other. So it's in this element, I think the, the technically te separated on the opcon transfer issues between the US ROK alliance, but uh, the strategically, the form of the opcon transfer after the uh, US FK to the, it's now so-called the future combined force command in Korea, but this the kind of the, the what kind of form of the new command structure in Korean Peninsula? It's definitely affect of the current uh, command structure of the United Nations Command. So in that reason, that that is one of the opportunity to redefine to the uh, the appropriate mix of the, our command and regional command and control system, not only the three countries, but also domestically, for instance, the relationship between the indo pacom and ESFK, and uh, how do we, uh, indo pacom and the ESG, USFJ, USFJ. Right. The, how do we dealing with the, those kind of uh, war fighting command and the supporting command. Yes. If I could add something sure. to that. I mean, so thinking about trilateral integration between the United States, Japan, and South Korea, it completely makes sense from um, a military capabilities perspective, but it, that is exactly what China opposes and will do everything it can to oppose. So if you remember the THAAD blow, out, uh, blow up, you know, that's what it really was about. China did not want to see uh, moves by U.S. allies, especially South Korea, to link into any sort of U.S. missile defense system, um, and it pushed South Korea to commit not to, um, you know, to say it commits not to pursue any sort of trilateral alliance with the United States and Japan. And so I think, you know, some things that make sense sort of militarily uh, do, do not always, you know, would undercut other parts of the relationship, and that's one kind of screw that could, um, uh, could mess up this warming of relations between China and Japan as well. Um, so that's one thing to keep our minds on, yeah. And a very so how do you balance that, yeah. So very important. And Scott, did you want to add anything on sort of ROK perspectives on this Well, yeah, I was just in uh, South Korea where we had a workshop on the OBCON transition issue. Uh, and, you know, one of the really sensitive points uh, related to that process 
is the relationship of the new Korean commander of future CFC uh, to the UNC structure. And so in some sense, this is a particularly sensitive time to try to address the relationship of Japan to that, because obviously Japan was not a sending state at the time of the Korean War. It is the host of UNC Rear. Uh, I think that it is, would be smart for USFK to find channels by which to provide effective briefings for USFK working with USFJ you know, to the Japanese in order to have a better understanding of the threat environment from a Korean Peninsula perspective. But this may be a particularly unpropitious moment to try to take that up. No, thank you. Well, let me, um, I'm sure the audience has a lot of questions as well. So let me um, invite questions from the audience. Again, if you could uh, state your name and your affiliation, and then if you could keep your question relatively short and also identify who you'd like to respond to the question. Thank you. I'll start maybe over here and then go to the very back over there. Yes. I was going to ask you to go back to the automotive sorry, industry. Could you state your name and? Uh, sorry, uh, my name is Jim Patrick, uh, and I'm just a, a member of the Japan America Society. I wanted to go back Which to the we automotive. It. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wanted to go back to the automotive sec yeah. sector. Uh, before we had the most recent good news about this trade deal between the U.S. and Japan, uh, the background to that was Trump tariffs on steel and aluminum, and then the sort of uh, the big issue for the Japanese was possible tariffs on imported cars from Japan. And uh, the fear in Japan, I think, of some kind of quota or quantitative restrictions. Uh, I wonder if you think that that's the next shoe to fall in the U.S.-Japan relationship. Uh, do, do you think that in this coming year we're going to see those kind of moves from the Trump administration? Uh, how do you see that working out? Yeah, thanks. That's a that's a really important question. So all of those things are still on the table, right? That's that that they haven't been resolved, and there's and and there there are significant threats. We also recently, um, when when President Trump was in Davos and he was he's made threats towards the German automobile industry as well. Um, trade, it's right trade in a very highly visible, important economically key good. Um, much of the US-Japan trade deficit that the president is so worried about is because of the Prius. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a car, an automobile driven um, uh, gap. And so I, those, that's definitely, I think we'll hear talk about that. I, my hope is that everyone will stay at the table talking about that as we, as we did in the we, we saw in the past, um, but that's going to be, I, I would be surprised if either tariffs were placed on Japan or quantitative restrictions um, or a new round of voluntary export <laughs> restraints were placed on Japanese automobiles this year. If the president is reelected, that's something we could look, look forward to in 2021. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the back and then I'll come up to you here. Hello, uh, Eric Gomez from the Cato Institute, and I have a question related to um, INF. And in the lead up to the initial decision to deploy the Pershings and the Griffins in Europe in the late 70s, uh, what was very striking about that was that European allies led the effort to deploy them, that they wanted them, they said that they needed them, even though the US didn't really want to do it, the Carter administration was kind of dragged along. I'm curious, what is the alliance dynamic um, with Japan and the decision with modern sort of systems now that the U.S. is out of INF. Um, I know that supporters of the missiles are saying, yeah, you know, uh, even if the allies aren't totally on board now, maybe China gets more aggressive and then we can, you know, put them in later. Um, but it seems like from what I've gathered listening to other things at the conference, it seems like there's not really a consensus within China or within Japan about the threat perception that China poses. And there might be an effort by the Abe administration with this outreach to Japan to find other ways to resolve security issues with China and reestablish that. So if anyone could, you know, talk to this and like Japanese threat perceptions of uh, China and do they actually feel this sort of similar need to have this kind of US system or is it something else? 
Mustache, we can start with you on Japanese views on possibility of, of U.S. deployment of medium-range missiles in okay. Japan. Thank you very much for the, your questions. The, at first, that uh, so that is the, one of the one of the reason why I emphasize on the importance of the the U.S.-Japan alliance. We will start to discussing about our strategic objectives. The before that, starting to the specific weapon system issues and uh, including to the uh, the basing location issues. The, of course, that uh, we can easily to imagine to if we start into the this specific issues. The, it is easy to. Uh, have them some trouble and uh, uh, involved to the same the domestic conflict, domestic political conflicts, including Okinawa. So in my so that is my the my thought. The first priority is is starting to the U.S. Japan alliance should start to discuss about strategic goals, and the second is the identifying the, our tactical goals means the, including to the share the threat assessment and capability assessment, and third. The two share, starting with the share, those threat and capability uh, assessment, and we start into the, our the targeting coordination mechanism. So we, if Japan, uh, JSTF itself, or the inviting or hosting US uh, operated ground-based missiles, those kind of missiles, it has a huge impact to the not only Japan society, but also the, the strategic, strategic calculation of China and North Korea. So in that reason, but uh, it's a difference of the number of the capability, number of the launchers and the missiles and the capa and the, how do we uh, uh, allocate those kind of capabilities is depends on the, the tactical objectives. What is the targets? So what is the, our operational concept? The target, so more specifically, our target is, what is our target? Is the f uh, fixed target or moving target, like a Chinese PLA vessels, or uh, other option is targeted to the ch Chinese airstrips to degrade it to ch Chinese counter-air uh, counter capabilities. So in that reason, I think that the most important thing is we start into the, the strategic and the tactical uh, concept development. Uh, so after that, we should, we, we can uh, move, in, move into that more, the specific argument about the, what is the, where is the appropriate location of the deployment of those kind of missiles. Scott, did you want to add anything on potential Korean reactions if uh, they were asked? Yeah, is better on this, but so far we can see a supply signal, but I just don't see a demand signal in Asia. Uh, and so that's a problem from the perspective of those who see it as an important development related to U.S.-China strategy. Um, and Penny, maybe I'll ask you a related question. I mean, you mentioned how China came down very hard on South Korea for the THAAD deployment issue. I mean, really some tough, tough measures that really had a real hard impact on Korea. How do you think China would react if the U.S. began talks with Japan about deployment of intermediate range missiles in Japan? Japan's a bigger country, more able to react. Um, would they, so how do you think China would respond? I think China would respond in a similar way. Would it impact Japan in a similar way? That's, that's a you know, different question. Um, but I think they'd have they would see this as something they need to block that they can't just you know let um, let this happen and so again there would be this thaw in the Japan China relationship that would probably go away very quickly as well um, but you know there is a recognition again that in Beijing that Tokyo is sort of a lot more aligned with the U.S. It can't really put a, as, as easily put a wedge between the two powers. And so perhaps that might moderate China's strategy, but I can't see Beijing you know, staying, staying still and accepting it. All right. Well, over here with Jim, you get the prerogative of being the host, so. I'm jump in, I'm not yes. supposed to do this. Jim Shof, Carnegie Endowment. Um, thank you all. Uh, I wanna ask two quick 2020 questions, and they're primarily um, Korea related, so maybe Scott and whoever else wants to jump in. But number one, are we going to see a, f is there a forcing function within 2020 on the Japan-Korea forced labor case issue? Is, is there some kind of 
deadline where Seoul has to make a decision about how it's going to handle liquidation of assets or, or, or can this stretch out beyond 2020. Um, and then the second piece is, will we see a North Korean nuclear test in 2020, do you think? We'll start with Scott on those two easy questions. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not aware of a forcing function on the forced labor. It seems to me that the Korean government has made a decision to hold. Uh, but, the, but, but I also haven't, I don't, I don't know if there are some specific other issues related to the Supreme Court implementation process or something that I'm not aware of. In terms of nuclear tests this year, I mean, the, the ceiling for North Korean provocations is, is not clearly President Trump's statements, it's China. Uh, and I don't think that China is, uh, would, would be able to absorb and tolerate uh, another nuclear test uh, without uh, undertaking a, uh, a response that would be severely adverse to North Korean interests. And I would just echo that. I think North Korea understands well that China has its own red lines. Um, it experienced that in the, tw in the late 2017 period when it was really ramping up its tests. And China, you know, there is a lot of economic leverage that China has. And so far, it's relaxed many of its sanctions. It's allowing North Korea to breathe, but that can close very quickly. And I think the North Koreans understand that. And, you know, in, according to the New Year's messaging and so on, you know, the, the, the comment has been, well, don't expect economic sanctions relief anytime soon. We need to trudge on. And in order to trudge on, you really need that lifeline from China. And so I don't think they're going to test anytime soon. Then again, North Korea, you can never predict. So I, I don't want to be held to that prediction. But <laughs> I think there has been uh, signaling, uh, certainly, from Beijing. And, and you see Beijing sort of trying to coax uh, North Korea as well. And in the Security Council, you know, Beijing and Russia propose together that we relax sanctions on North Korea. So it's, it's doing both. It's doing the pressuring and sort of the coaxing. Thank you. OK, we'll go here and then open there here next. Thank you. Uh, Ardovan Mobusheri at University of Richmond. Um, I guess this is a question for, for everyone up there, James, including yourself. You, you talked about earlier uh, how the potential uh, closeness of, of relations, whether it's tourism or, or economics, is, is maybe could potentially changing. And uh, Scott mentioned the identity issue in, in between uh, Korea and, and, and the Japanese. Pat mentioned the Chinese attitudes towards Japan. And Christian, you alluded to some opinion polls. To, some, to what extent do you think what's maybe preventing some of these uh, uh, issues from progressing? Is, is it a generational issue? at play here, right, or, or a Brexit issue, right? If, if, if we had kept the votes on everybody under 40 in Britain, that the vote would have uh, failed overwhelmingly. To what extent is it the memory, you know, of the, of, of, the, uh, of the past playing a role for the older generation that is right now in the decision-making uh, apparatus that in five or 10 years could be shifting to the new generation that maybe, to, to what extent do you think that there's a divide here, or is there a commonality? Whether you're 25-year-old Japanese or Korean or 70-year-old Japanese or Korean, you have the same attitudes. Uh, do you want to start, and then I'll ask others yeah, to jump in. Uh, on, on the Korean side, uh, the generational divide that has stemmed from uh, the Park Geun-hye Abe Comfort Women Agreement of 2015 was actually that older Koreans supported it because they supported Park, and younger uh, Koreans were against it because they supported Moon. And so the problem isn't generational, it's actually political polarization, uh, deepening political polarization in South Korea and the entanglement of the Japan-South Korea relationship in domestic Korean politics. Uh, and the key issue there is really related to an ongoing struggle between the executive uh, and judicial independence issues in which the su former Supreme Court justice was embroiled in part for advising the executive that it would be a bad idea uh, to move forward on the uh, forced labor cases because it had implications for foreign relations. And so it's really complicated and messy on the Korean side uh, and very politicized. Asashi, did you want to add anything to that from the Jap Japan's perspective? Oh, that sounds uh, sorry, Bob, did you want to Yeah, I can particularly speak to um, the Chinese Chinese politics with that respect. And there's been, 
Um, th there's a lot of uh, optimism in particularly in the Japanese business community in China and to some extent in um, among Japanese diplomats that have uh, have worked in China that there will be a generational shift as as memories living memories of the wartime atrocities fade unfortunately um, there's there's not a lot of evidence to, to support that and we actually see more virulent Opinions amongst younger generations in China. There's there's some mixed mixed research on this, but I think I, and I'm curious if you agree, Patty. But that that the, in particular, as a result of the patriotic education campaigns that were initiated in the 1990s, attitudes have really hardened amongst younger generations in China towards Japan. And so, what's preventing issues from progressing? Well, I mean, in, with China and Japan, there's in order to like take a risky diplomatic step. There are some pretty strong domestic constraints from a very nationalist anti-Japan population. So there's that, that even, it's not a democracy; they're not electorally accountable, but there there is a degree of accountability, and and that is being held right. So Japan-China relations are held back by that, and even more so by younger by younger people. So that that sort of bodes negatively for for the future, is the way I read it. Want to add to that? You agree with yeah, yes, that? I okay. Agree. I think we have time for two more questions. So that one here, and then one further back there. Yes. Hello, uh, Neil Silver, retired U.S. Uh, Foreign Service officer. This question is primarily for Ms. Kim, uh, and this relates to the Senkaku's Dalutai. Uh, there are probably half a dozen. Uh, major maritime and island issues between the United States and Canada, including up along the main border, which you never hear about. And I realize U.S. and Canada, <laughs> it's a lot different relationship from China and Japan. And I can understand why, from a Chinese political and nationalist point of view, con continuing to stir the war issues uh, makes sense. And I can even understand why the Chinese government would assert its, you know, what it wants to assert over the Senkakus. But what I find more difficult to understand is the continuing increase in incursions. Why do they do that? Um, I've heard at least two Chinese popular takes on the issue. One is, um, you know, that this is just a spit of sand out there. It makes absolutely no sense that the we, the Chinese, uh, demanded that, the, that Russia give back hundreds of thousands of square miles, and then the issue went away. I've also heard the Chinese assert that there's probably a lot of oil out there, and that's why the Chinese government uh, asserts this. But still, any, why, why do they keep this issue in their teeth the way they seem to? I think there's a lot of factors. As you mentioned, there's resources, there's a history behind it, there's a nationalism factor, and I think the bottom line is, why is China doing this more now? Because it can, because it has the ability, its military capabilities are growing, and it sees, um, you know, it's been doing this not just in the East China Sea, but also in the South China Sea. So I think the behavior accords, and it sees sort of this as the strategic period where it could start asserting its rights that it couldn't in the past. Um, and I think that's the bottom line. If I could just add your comment on resources. Um, in 2008, China and Japan did conclude an agreement dividing up areas where one side or the other could explore for oil and leaving aside areas that were disputed. Um, so that was seen as a positive step over, OK, let's, since we have this dispute, let's at least ex uh, exploit the resources where we can. Unfortunately, since then, I think China has explored for oil in the area where they had agreed right. not to do so. So one of the, I think one of our speakers earlier this morning mentioned the hope that Prime Minister Abe would try and restart that agreement or get some Chinese um, acceptance that that's a base for further discussion of how you exploit the resources in an area where each side has claims. Yeah, with, with the Senkaku's Diayutai, the U.S. has a commitment under the security treaty because it's under the administration of Japan, so it's it's different from at least from my way I look at it. So I'll jump in, but then I'll ask for. I think it, it is different, but 
China is not invading the Senkakus and probably won't because of that security code. What they're doing is pushing the envelope and making Japan uncomfortable. And what they would like Japan to do is let's talk about this issue. And Japan is saying we won't talk about it because there's no dispute. So you're right, the US uh, security guarantee does provide a constraint, but not a constraint to current Chinese activities. I don't know if you would agree with that. I agree with that, yeah. Okay, one more question in the back and then. Uh, right, yeah, you right there, sorry. Thank you, my name is Kyung Gul Lee and I'm a student from South Korea who is currently studying here. And I have a question for Scott. Uh, you mentioned about the ideology factor uh, of Korean domestic politics influencing Korea's attitude toward Japan and especially the progressive liberal wing being more aggressive toward uh, Japanese. But uh, looking back historically, I'm not sure if that is always the whole story because uh, when we see like incidents in 2012 or like between 2013 to 2014, we see a lot of clashes between uh, Korean conservative presidents like Lee Myung-bak or Park Geun-hye with uh, Japanese administrations about historical issues, territorial issues, and lots of security issues. And also, uh, we can go back further like to uh, another, con another conservative president, Kim Young-sam, who was also very uh, critical about Japanese and historic in historical ways. And also, uh, liberals tended to be more uh, approach uh, uh, more like approaching Japan, uh, Japan, especially in like Kim Dae Jung era, and maybe in the early 2017, 2018, when there were lots of dialogues between Moon and Abe. Uh, so I, I, would, I wanted to ask you why you viewed ideology factor as a huge factor determining uh, Korea-Japan relations and how that mechanism works in Korean politics. Yeah, it's a very good question, and I'm glad that you asked it because you offered some clarifying. Uh, observations that are very useful. And I, I don't want to say it's a huge factor, but it was one of three factors that I named. And the reason why I named that was not necessarily uh, uh, from a perception of what was happening on the South Korean side, but rather a perception of what is happening on the Japanese side. And, and what I see happening over time on the Japanese side is a perception in Japan that has kind of dug in related to the idea that progressives are open to changing Korean identity by moving closer to North Korea. Uh, and, and that has become embedded in the Japanese foreign policy default view uh, as a, a view that actually divides capacity to work with conservatives from capacity to work with progressives to the extent that the government of Japan and uh, elites almost seem to have given up on the idea of having a stable relationship with a progressive political leader in South Korea. Thanks very much. OK, we have about um, nine minutes left, so I'm going to give each of you two minutes. And my question to each of you is not to make a prediction about the year, because that is, uh, in a way, too easy. I'm going to make it a little bit harder. <laughs> um, and it, when I was in government, we would look at what we called low probability, high impact scenarios. What might happen? Not that we're predicting it will happen, but what might happen that would have a huge impact on Northeast Asia. So I'd like each of you to throw out one thing we should be a little bit worried about, even if it's not a prediction that you're making. Can I maybe start with you? Sure. Um, so when you pose this to me, um, you know, I was racking my brain. And there are a lot of, actually, medium probability even, <laughs> like US troop withdrawals from the Korean Peninsula and what that might mean for the US-Japan alliance and so on. Um, but maybe a very low probability and high impact event that could sh completely shake up Northeast Asia is if we see progress in uh, nuclear negotiations with North Korea and we see progress towards a peace deal and then there's a push to truly denuclearize the Korean Peninsula, which means retracting the US extended deterrence nuclear umbrella guarantee and maybe including even Japan in a nuclear free zone and a neutral zone. So I've heard this proposed, not, you know, not seriously by any political leader, but in you know, Track 1.5's Chinese colleagues have brought up this idea. Um, and it's very far-fetched, but I can see it resonating with certain communities uh, within, well, obviously China could support that. I was going to say China would be quite happy with that outcome. <laughs> um, you know, there may be North Korea. I, I don't know. I mean, North Korea might have a mixed opinion on that. Um, South Koreans, there would be, there may be, um, you know, segments that appeal to this idea of a neutral Korean peninsula, and then, there, you know, there are also segments of Japanese society with these very strong non-proliferation norms that I can see gravitating towards that idea as well. 
I think it's far-fetched. I don't think it's going to happen, especially because I don't think there is going to be too much progress in the nuclear negotiations anytime soon. But if this were to happen, this would have huge implications, obviously, for the U.S. alliance network in Asia and just gl globally as well. well. Thank you. So we should be thinking about what if there's progress and what does mm -hmm. that mean? I think that's a yeah. good, uh, even if the probability is not high. Okay, Masashi, we'll go to you next. Uh, it is the, the, the echo of the, how, in, how the uh, answers that if the North Korea uh, uh, agree to the complete nuclear denuclearization, it is a, a huge impact to the regional the, uh, uh, security environment. And uh, uh, after that, the, how do we coordinate with the, the Japan and ROK relationships because of the, if we can share the perceptions North Korea is already uh, no longer uh, is the threat of us. The second question is the what is the what is the objectives of the ROK forces and the ESF case and the South Korea's capability itself. So how do we adjust into the the trilateral cooperation in the era of the strategic competition with China's? But at the same time, this is a very complex uh, question for. Uh, ROK politics. So we are, of course, uh, we understand that, that uh, complexity. But uh, if those kind of situation uh, we face, that that is one of the, the uh, next huge question is is arise. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, so thinking about this from a sort of a trade institutional standpoint, a I think low probability thing is that if um, President Trump either signaled strong intentions or actually did withdraw the United States from the World Trade Organization. Um, something he's mentioned, but it's, again, I think very low probability. Um, if but that high happened, impact. it would be very high impact. And uh, that would, so right now the WTO is still the framework that underlies the uh, international uh, trade, trade institutions, even in our, in our regional trade agreements. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about which way Japan is going to try and lead or lean either of those in terms of its economic statecraft and economic leadership. And if the United States did decide to um, move a, completely away from a multilateral trading system, I think that question would be answered and Japan would lean very regionally Asia and would try and start forming partnerships um, with Chinese leadership. And we would see more, more of a uh, Asian, uh, more Asian trade institutionalization that would try and replace um, a probably qu very quickly crumbling world trading system. Okay, thank you. Scott? So I've got two black swan events for 2020. Uh, one is a nuclear accident in North Korea that requires, that is so severe that it requires international help. Uh, and the second, um, given Moon's marginalization uh, from the uh, inter-Korean dialogue and Trump's potential distraction, uh, that Kim Jong-un uh, reaches out to Abe uh, as the last leader <laughs> Uh, <laughs> remaining, uh, who can, um, through his action of meeting with Kim Jong Un, uh, implicitly recognize North Korea as a nuclear state? Could I just pull the thread a little okay. on your first black swan, <laughs> uh, the nuclear accident piece? Um, how do you think China would react to an international response as opposed to a Chinese response to a nuclear accident in North Korea? I and think maybe if, I'll ask you, ask you to, to answer that as well. I, I think once it becomes public to that degree, it's not going to be possible for China to control it. And I mean, China has expressed in the past, we're comfortable with, you know, peacekeeping forces or something of that sort in North Korea. So it's not like they would oppose any sort of foreign presence in North Korea. So I think if, there, if it was a nuclear accident type level of um, happening, then, uh, you know, you could see China opening up. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank the panel for a great discussion. And thank you all for being such a great audience today. Thank you so much, Jim and everyone. I really appreciate that. That's a fun game, and, and I want to I want to add one. Um, my thought was uh, Chinese economic meltdown would oh, be okay. uh, very low probability, but uh, would 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 be huge. So be prepared. Um, no, I, I just want to thank you all, our previous panel, our keynote speakers, and you all get the dedicated Japan follower award yes, for sticking, sticking with, with us, us. Um, <laughs> here to the end. It's a long, a long day, day, but uh, I think we, we covered a lot. Uh, here's to a, a very uh, prosperous and healthy 2020 for all of you. And uh, we'll keep seeing you here at Carnegie or over at the Japan America Society. Thanks a lot, Brian. Yeah, thank you.
discussion. I really appreciated your perspective. I don't think I've given you my card yet. Let me uh, let me do that, and certainly let me know if there's things ever I can be involved. So that was fun. Very interested in your 